Hi there. Let's talk today about Egypt and Nubia. Egypt is a huge subject. One area of Africa that is probably more researched than any other area. It has an extraordinary history that is ancient and rich and full of art and extraordinary monuments. And unfortunately in this class I really can't give it its entire due for what is known. A class devoted entirely to Egypt is necessary. In this class though I do feel it is necessary to put Egypt back in Africa because for often, so often when we talk about Egypt we really think of it as a kind of an, an extension or a continuation of Western civilization and it's often included in studies that sort of talk about it as a kind of continuum from Egypt to Greece to Rome to the Renaissance on and on through European history the influence of Egypt is seen. But I would say that what's often missing from this discussion is that in fact Egypt owes and has a lot of characteristics which are distinctive and important to the overall history of Africa and its influence and its uh, in significance can be seen in that light as well. So let's put Egypt back in Africa. As many museums are today, they've taken Egypt out of their European collections and they've reinvested it into their African art collections, trying to show this important dialogue that the art of Egypt has with other arts in Africa. To begin with, let's look back before the formation of ancient Egypt, in North Africa, to a time in around 8000 BCE, when large fauna roamed the area. We can see this from the geological, um, archaeological evidence, but also from some extraordinary uh, rock art that has been found in North Africa and is now known as the Saharan Desert. Here we see depictions of elephants and crocodiles and giraffes, animals that haven't lived there for thousands of years. Clearly, at this time, this was part of the ecology of this region. The desert was not always a desert. It was once a lunch forested region with lakes and rivers. How did this change take place? We'll talk about soon. But the important is that humans at this time were creating a record and also uh, investing their own art in the animals that, that they saw there. We call this early art from North Africa the large wild fauna style after the large wild fauna that are depicted. The purpose of this art is not entirely known. In many cases people have often assumed that this work has something to do with hunting magic. But these are not the animals they hunted. And the meaning of this art, we have no real culture to connect it with. So it's entirely speculative to make any assumptions about what this art signifies to the people who made it. But we can see a very closely realized uh, attention to detail. The animals are moving, the animals are alive, the animals are clearly a very important part of their lives. What makes it very difficult to date this art is it's not painted and that it's usually scratched onto rock surfaces that are often exposed to the elements so that it's more difficult to date than something that might be in an enclosed cave uh, area where the sediments have been more carefully maintained and it's possible to do uh, more accurate archaeological research. So when we look at the rock art of North Africa, we can see that these are sites that have been worked on for centuries that or thousands of years that people marked on these stones, scratched into these stones over and over again. They represented some very important spot or location where people believed that magical properties existed in the rocks. They were drawing them out is one assumption. 
We can see here also, uh, again, a kind of sense of uh, the accuracy of the line, the view of the animals being an important part of their lives. And this rock art is an important testament to the huge variety of animals that lived in this region. What you don't see are images of people. And this doesn't emerge until about 8,000 to 6,000 BCE. Now we see painted images. I believe early paint was used in body adornment. And then it's now used to paint on the, the caves. You see uh, people wearing clothing, wearing headdresses. We see jewelry. Uh, we see all kinds of specific identifying markers of status and roles in society. So we clearly we have a stratified society with special roles and then people are being identified as such. We also see geometric designs, abstract forms that uh, we don't know how to interpret. This early roundhead style, we start to see the people uh, exist in relationship to each other, see dancing figures, and they're very often uh, it's believed that they have something to do with fertility. This is especially evident in this very famous uh, painting from North Africa in South Tunisia. In this site we see a dancing female figure with a kind of large horns. The horns make people believe it is some kind of animal human deity. And this is something we see a lot in Africa and of course very important in ancient Egypt as well is this kind of animal human deities, probably processed in some kind of shamanistic traditions where people go into trance and they become a medium for an animal spirit to embody them. And we see this kind of shimmering halo, probably like rain or rainwater, again suggesting the idea of fertility, this youthful body in a dynamic pose. Uh, striding uh, energetically. All of these suggest a kind of life and vitality. This is very important to uh, the region at this time. Here is an artist's rendition of the painting. You can start to see a bit more of the details here. You see smaller figures sort of surrounding the figure, dancing or moving in a, a common direction. We see things that might be rainbows or other symbols of rain and fertility. The female figure is also found in sculptural uh, representations, very abstract, wide-hipped, these sort of arms that are hooked back behind the head like horns, and a face that looks like a bird. Again, again we don't know what these figures mean, but it's possible that these are a part of a kind of fertility cult that celebrated um, the female body as a site of fertility. The pastoralists uh, we start to see emerge around 5000 BCE and now we not only see human figures but we also see domesticated animals, horses, cattle, uh, goats, sheep, and other animals that have been brought in and traded from Mesopotamia. We start to see uh, a the significance and the growing status of these animals in the environment. And this really was probably the advent of the decline of the, the ecology of the region as the animals grew in significance and their population overwhelmed um, the uh, jungle forests and grasslands of North Africa the region uh, became a desert. So human activity was a very important part of the decline in the region and the eventual migration of the people out of North Africa toward the coast and over to the Nile where we start to see the development of a new uh, society. Here you can see the rock art in context a little bit. This is what I mean. They're, they're sort of in, uh, in rock surfaces that are still close to the surface that people can visit fairly equally easily. Um, it's very difficult uh, to 
locate and map many of the art pieces out in the Saharan Desert. It's believed to be many thousands of paintings out there that have been documented. Uh, you can start to see uh, here how they are on a rock face um, in a shallow outcropping. The style of the art of the pastoralist uh, is something that seems related to the early uh, art of the ancient Egyptian relief carvings. Notice the treatment of the horse and the chariot in the pastoralist North African painting and the way in which they are treated in the same sort of flat representational way in Egyptian art. So there is a cultural link we can see from the early North African pastoralist society to the later Egyptian representation on temple buildings. Early Nile culture begins to develop in the second half of the fifth millennium. We start to see uh, domesticated uh, plants and animals along the Nile and a growing uniform culture which establishes a greater hierarchy. Uh, we start to see political and economic consolidation and eventually wars and battles to unify the region. This ripple flake knife you see here is just one example of the absolute exquisite craftsmanship that emerges in the early Nile culture. The ripple flake knife, you can see the extraordinary uh, accuracy with which they are making these tools. Now, if a knife edge like this can be made fairly simple. These blades are quite common. And for thousands of years, they were simply just knock a sharp edge on a rock and you could use it as a tool. In this case here, the ripple flake is so accurate and so precise, it creates a, a shape which is a kind of exquisite example of craftsmanship that exceeds its utility. It's a kind of way we could start to see an aesthetic appreciation of high mastery of artwork. One of the things we start to see in the formation of the Nile culture is a lot of the cultural traits that develop in ancient Egypt uh, are also mimicked in other areas throughout Africa. Uh, we can see a very important significance of maternity images, fertility figures, uh, the female body is a site of fertility, uh, markings of uh, scarification and other forms of body adornment, uh, very central to the appreciation of the ideas of fertility in female bodies. We also have circumcision, male initiation rites practiced throughout Africa, ancestor worship, the idea that the source of cultural knowledge and the continuity of the civilization comes from the ancestors and that they are worshipped in a variety of different ways. We also have the idea of a king who has this direct link to this ancestral past. It is very important that they have this and maintain this relationship, that they gain power, fertility, and wisdom from the ancestors then they are partially divine in their ability to rule and create great works. We also see in ancient Egypt and throughout Africa this idea of animal deities and symbols, that the role of animals in people's lives take on a supernatural power and people use them to um, symbolize important aspects of their spiritual world. There are also a number of very interesting sort of domestic tools that we will look at that are very similar throughout Africa. One of the most common ones is the headdress or pillow. This is what people sleep on. These sort of, you see pictured here, a kind of simple wooden stand with a curved wooden base. Sometimes they're made of more um, expensive material. Sometimes they're not uh, made of pieces of wood, as you see here, but you actually start to see, uh, you know, localized stylization. But the general function and general character of these headdresses is remarkably consistent throughout Africa.
Now let's talk about the symbolism that's specific to Africa. And one of the most important ideas in Africa, of course we'll talk about it at length later, is the idea of hieroglyphs, which is a series of symbols that represents very specific ideas and sometimes sounds in their language. Uh, so the hieroglyph has and conveys a kind of powerful meaning. And one of the ways in which they use those hieroglyphs is not only do they write them on boards and carve them into the walls, but they actually wore them as amulets, symbols of power that they carried with them on a daily basis. And everybody did this, from the very poorest of Egyptians to the most wealthy, people carried amulets. And this is something we also see elsewhere in Africa, and it's a very interesting way in which people uh, body adornment and symbols of power. We can see this in uh, the Maasai, and we can see this in the Yoruba, we can see this in all different parts of Africa. This idea of the amulet having a kind of magical power, an ability to make meaning through uh, wearing a specific symbol or sign. This is the Wajat eye. Wajat means the green one and is a symbol of fertility, a symbol of protection. The eye is a kind of guardian. It is something that is there to ward off evil. Now there are right-looking eyes and left-looking eyes, and they each have different meanings. Left-looking eyes are lunar and express the idea of change and transformation. The right-looking eye, which is more common, has this idea of a kind of powerful protective. This is the idea of the solar eye. And the eye, as it's depicted here, sort of indicates the common eye makeup that was worn among the nobility. The eye makeup was very stylized and very heavy, and it was meant to make your eye look like the eye of a hawk, because the hawk was considered the symbol of fertility and power that the nobility identified with. So here, this uh, right-looking eye, the widget eye, is uh, a symbol that someone would wear uh, for protection. The eye is a hieroglyph that is very common. It had a meaning of the idea of to make or to do, uh, and it was something of bringing things into the world. It says that the people of ancient Egypt didn't think of looking at something as a passive activity. They saw the eye is actually something that created things, that brought things into being. That to see something is to make it real. And so the amulet, I think, has the same kind of power. It is something that is visible, something that is worn, it becomes a part of the person. It is something that brings that into being, brings that into reality. So the visual culture of ancient Egypt was very important. It was very important because it created the world that was consistent and spoke to them in this very powerful and immediate way. Here's another example of an amulet. This one would have been worn by mummies, and the mummification was a very important process for the purification of the body, the preservation of the body, as the spirit moved on into the, uh, the spirit world to in the realm of the ancestors. So this scarab was a symbol of this return, the eternal return, the sun which moves through the sky, uh, lives and then dies at sunset and is reborn in the, the dawn. And the scarab is this beetle that collects dung in a large ball and pushes it up the dunes of the Sahara. So the scarab becomes a symbol of this thing that moves the sun. The sun being the symbol of transformation, the idea of death and rebirth, and the scarab is the force that brings those forces into play. Wearing this, and in the back it would have an inscription of the Book of the Dead. We'll talk about that later, this very important text all about the uh, the rebirth of the spirit um, from this, the body. Uh, this is a part of this important culture that was growing in strength and identity with the idea of the pharaoh cult. Now the pharaoh cult is really a part of this sort of unification of Egypt. 
and this one powerful war leader with absolute power who ruled over Egypt. And it was their ability to rule was really contingent on part their family lineage, that they belonged to a family that had inherited the idea of this continuity that had been inherited through this dynasty, but also their ability to bring fertility, to create great works. Their ability charismatically to draw people to them was also a very important part of the authority of the pharaoh. And there were more successful pharaohs and less successful pharaohs in their ability to kind of make things happen. To unify the upper and uh, lower Egypt was a very important symbol of a pharaoh's power, the sort of military might that they could muster. And we start to see that first happen around 3100 BCE, and that's really sort of the dawn of what we call the Pharaoh period, third dynasty after the unification of the upper and lower Nile is really where the main features of Egyptian culture comes into play. We see here, of course, the very famous pyramids of Giza, where we start to see the most magnificent works of ancient Egypt. And these were made really very early on in the dynasties. They abandoned the idea of the pyramids, not only because it was enormously expensive to produce, but it was also very difficult to protect, that these were robbed uh, and that they were uh, also uh, probably a, a problem with the construction because they were exposed to the intense sun and heat. They were crumbling and the, the facade of them broke down very quickly. And so they always looked a little bit shabby, even to the ancient Egyptians. Very important symbol that predates the... Uh, uh, pyramids of old, is the Sphinx. This uh, huge edifice that now uh, sits in front of the Pyramid of Khafra, the largest of the pyramids of ancient Egypt in Giza. The Sphinx was probably remade at the time of the making of the pyramid, the face recarved and recut with the face of Khafra. And this is a very important idea in Egypt because there was always this need to sort of reinvent the past so that it conformed to the present, so that there was a way that there's kind of sense of continuity, this sort of enforced continuity. Everything had to always look like it had always been there. And so by putting the face of the pharaoh Khafra on the ancient sphinx, we start to see this idea that Khafra had always been pharaoh, was the epitome of the typical pharaoh, and was what would be the image of the pharaoh forevermore. And so there's this sort of remaking. And what we see in ancient Egypt is this extremely conservative uh, holding to tradition. Uh, that is very important to the identity, this idea of the maintaining tradition. The priesthood, which was responsible for all these religious rites, was enormously powerful. And they made it their job to be sure that this tradition was maintained exactly as it had been received. Now, of course, it changed. But any time it changed, it was always described as a return to the past. Here we see some classic examples of early Egyptian statuary, and you can see it's very conservative. Uh, the limbs tight, close to the body. We see uh, this idea of the protecting uh, of the, the child. Uh, the symbol, the symbolic power of this is it's this very solid, very stable, very eternal. Uh, there was a very stylized way of representing the figure, and this is a classic. We've seen this. For, I'm sure you've seen uh, in examples of Egyptian art before, and it was all based on the hand. The size of a fist was sort of the basic unit of measurement. A typical figure was made to have 18 hands in height, and the proportions of that were the sort of graphed out at scale so that every part of the body was ideally represented. The shoulders forward, the head in profile, the, the hips on the side, the legs standing forward. You can't really stand this way. It has elements of naturalism, but it is sort of forced into a kind of flat 
direction so that you see the ideal aspects of each part of the body. And this is an important way of representing uh, figures in ancient Egypt that was carried through its entire history. And it was interesting, though, that the more royal your figure was, the more idealized it would be. And the peasants and the servants and the, the lower level people were treated in a more naturalistic way. They were allowed to have greater variety of postures and figures and actions. So it's a very interesting the way the pharaoh cult maintained this aesthetic distance to those people in power. And this is another interesting aspect. We'll talk about nobility and royalty in Africa. And the same thing applies as well. That the greater your power and authority, the more a remove you are from everyday life. Here's the animus mask. Uh, there are not many examples of actual masks though the masks play a very important role throughout Africa and African art, here is one example that has survived. Uh, and it looks like something that would actually have been worn. You can see where it would have rested on someone's shoulders. We see eye holes where someone could have looked through. Uh, it, would, it could have been worn by someone, perhaps a priest, uh, officiating some aspect of the embalming of the pharaoh or the royal family and in this process would have been uh, uh, in a role that is described in the Book of the Dead. You see uh, an example of the Book of the Dead here uh, where the Anubis is this guide through the, the spirit world and plays this very important role of weighing the soul of the heart of the pharaoh against a feather. And of course, the, the heart of the pharaoh must be lighter than a feather. This way in which uh, we, we, we speculate about rituals in Egypt, there are lots of texts which describe rituals in a very uh, literary way, uh, full of symbols and references. It's very hard to actually understand what was really being done during these rites. Uh, but there's clearly a lot of symbolism associated with this progress of the spirit through the underworld into the abode of the ancestors. Now, for the most part, pharaohs in Egypt were male and they had uh, a kind of uh, patriarchal society that passed the power of the, the pharaoh from father to son. There were a few women who became pharaohs and some who were quite successful and very effective pharaohs. In the case of Hapshitsa, who uh, inherited the, took the throne from her son, who had inherited it at a very young age, she initially managed it in his stead until he grew of age, but then she grew into the role and was quite accepted in her, her power and was very successful leading armies into battle, unifying uh, the upper and lower Nile and having an extraordinary impact on the development of ancient Egyptian culture and reviving temples, etc., etc. She was so well established in her role as a pharaoh that when she was depicted, she sometimes was depicted with a beard as all pharaohs were. 